Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here today, and I have a, a new piece, um, which is a new essay um, that I've been working on. So I'm just going to dive Pleasing. It was 4 o'clock in the morning when my mother and her kidnapper reached the intersection of Highway 620 and Ranch Road 2222, where he would finally let her go. Early January 1972. My mother was not yet my mother. She was 19. No light in the sky and quiet but for the hiss of the wind through the trees. She wasn't bound and he no longer had his hands on her. They'd been walking for eight hours, starting just after dusk at the top of Mount Bunnell and snaking their way through the west side of Austin until they reached this deserted intersection in the black <coughs> stillness several hours before dawn. He bought her a Coke from a vending machine in front of the dark gas station. She wasn't a soda drinker, but of course she took it and said thanks. Guess this is where our ways will part, he said. Then he pointed down 2222 and told her she could get a ride from a farm truck in an hour or so. She walked away from him slowly, aware of every breath and every nerve on the back of her neck. When she turned and looked back over her shoulder, she saw that he'd turned too. She lifted her hand and waved goodbye. He waved back. That's the part of the story that always stuck with me, my mother waving. <laughs> After eight hours of trauma, of thinking that she would die, she was freed by the same man who'd taken her in the first place. In that moment, like in so many other moments she'd already lived, she had to perform gratitude. On a deserted highway in the middle of the night, after all she'd been through, she was still required to be unfailingly polite, to be pleasing. She waved. I probably would have waved too, in a similar situation. I might have squeaked out a thanks. When did we first become aware of the need to be pleasing, to be grateful it wasn't worse, to hold still and smile? After she waved, she turned back around and walked slowly in the direction she'd been told to go, down 2222. He disappeared into the trees that lined the road, and once he was completely out of sight, she turned onto 620 and began to run. <coughs> she told me that it was the most surreal part of the whole night, running down the middle of the two-lane highway, her bare feet slapping asphalt alone in the middle of the night. Soon she came to a farmhouse, ran up onto the porch, and pounded on the front door. When no one answered, she ran around and began pounding on a window. She saw a light go on and a man running toward the door with a shotgun. She remembers thinking, after everything I've survived tonight, this is how it's going to end. She shouted, it's me, it's just me, as if he knew her. <laughs> he quickly recognized she was not a threat, just a girl, so he opened the door and let her in. The man's wife and his seven-year-old son were awake too, of course, and they were upset. Despite everything that had happened to her that night, my mother remembers being worried about that little boy, about how scary this must be for him. She called the police. She held it together as best she could, doing everything she could to act as normal as possible. She sat at their dining room table, making small talk while she waited for her ride. She didn't want to make this worse for the little boy. She wanted him to know that everything would be all right. It began early the evening before, just after dusk. My mother was on top of Mount Bunnell, a popular lookout spot in Austin, with her boyfriend, a young man named Michael. They weren't formally engaged, but they'd been talking about marriage and children, making plans. Earlier that evening, they had been at a friend's potluck and had stopped at Mount Bunnell on the way home to spend a little more time together. They sat on a low stone wall, talking and looking down at Town Lake at the lights twinkling on the water. Nothing noteworthy about that particular Sunday night, until a voice came from behind them, telling them to turn around and don't make any trouble. Two men, a gun. She could smell the liquor on their breath. It wasn't clear at first what they wanted from my mom and Michael, two college kids out on a date. Was it a robbery? My mother felt everything slow down and go underwater. They said something about the car parked nearby, a VW bug that didn't belong to my mom or Michael. She watched Michael walk over to the car. He and one of the men had a conversation she couldn't hear. The man lifted his gun. Michael fell. My mother remembered thinking that the gun must have a silencer, although later she learned that there was no such thing for a gun like that. Then they took her. They led her barefoot down the side of the hill toward a waiting pickup truck, where in addition to the rifle, they had stashed a machete and a small hunting knife. The two men had a conversation she couldn't hear, and then the one without the gun took off on foot. She was a college sophomore, and her kidnapper, the murderer, was a stranger. Women are taught early to be pleasing. We are taught that the men will treat us better if we make things nice for them. 
if we make them feel good, if we purr and soothe in response to their growls, if we make it easy, if we say yes sir, if we don't push back. My mother was in no position to question this man's authority and she was going to do everything he told her to do. Before he told her to get in and lay on the floorboard, he made a point to show her his other weapons. Do you know what this is, he said, as he held up the machete? Yes, sir, she said. And then she curled up on the floorboard as nice and quiet as she could. She didn't know if she would survive. She was comforted by her belief in God and in a spiritual practice she shared with Michael, who she still believed to be alive. She'd seen him shot and she'd seen him fall, but her brain protected her in the middle of this most dangerous moment by not quite making all the connections. She climbed into the truck and made herself fit in the space provided, her toes curled against the metal door. The man at the wheel was Elvoy Musgrave, an escaped convict whose last known victim had been abducted from a lookout near a lake, raped and dumped from his car, naked but alive. There was no way to know what his plans were that night with my mother. Things had gotten complicated and she was a witness. It's easy to imagine how that could have been the end of the line for my mom and for me and for my brother and our happy childhood in suburban Austin for everything that came after. To imagine this whole lineage drying up, my mother just a faded picture of another missing girl. But soon after driving away with her in his truck, my mother's kidnapper hit a mailbox and he couldn't get his truck started again. Whatever, wherever it was he'd been planning to take her, he wouldn't be able to get there quick. I can point to all the things my mother did or didn't do, the puzzle of choices we attempt to connect in order to make sense of a defining moment, but I feel sure it was that mailbox that truly saved her. Rooted in the ground and unmoving, unbending. In that way, it was so unlike my mother herself, whose survival had always depended on pliancy. That mailbox met the front of the truck with a smack and changed the possibilities. Now on foot, my mother's kidnapper had to leave the machete and the rifle behind, taking only his hunting knife. Fate swerved. She was barefoot and small, but her kidnapper had fewer weapons and no transportation. Her primary strengths, to endure, to please, to disappear, would have sometimes find purchase. Pleasing is how smaller creatures slip away to safety. We flatten and wiggle if we have to, to get away. We can't charge or block. We must deflect instead. We must be a little slippery. During the wide stretch of night as my mother walked alongside this man in his custody, she made friendly conversation. Despite the horrors of the night, despite her fear, she had always been friendly and outgoing, having moved around a lot as a kid, and she told him stories about her life, about growing up in small towns across Texas, California, and Hawaii. She told him about her brother. She told him her real name. They talked about all kinds of things. After a while, she said, it was just like talking to anyone because you can't remain terrified for hours. She also told me that she was intentionally talking about herself as much as possible so that he would see her as human and be less likely to kill her. I wanted to believe that her charms played some role in saving her. I wanted to write about pleasing as a superpower, one of women's underappreciated strengths, how we don't even recognize it as a strength because of its femininity. But the more I wrote and thought about it and the more the caveats piled up, the more I had to reckon with the idea that while it is a strength, it isn't one to be celebrated. The cops told my mother that she was right to go along with the kidnapper and do what he said, but they also told her it was a crapshoot as to who survived and who didn't. <coughs> my mother doesn't think she saved herself. She did what she could, but it wasn't up to her. And so the need to be pleasing is just another burden, another weight piled on our plates. Not only do we have to endure, but we have to be nice about it. Because if we're not, it will be worse, and we will all know it was our fault. If pleasing was a superpower, it would actually protect us. Perhaps instead, it only makes us easier to swallow. After being forced to abandon the truck, my mother and her kidnapper walked through a residential neighborhood, through yards and along fences. She recognized that it was the same neighborhood where her friends lived. She'd been there earlier that day. That was not a comfort, though. She actually hoped that they wouldn't walk past the house, because she knew if she saw the same place she'd been that afternoon, she'd run screaming for it. And then it would be her fault when the monster followed her. For a while, she tried to remember street names, but soon she lost track. In one yard, she came across two Dobermans. Elvoy threatened to slit their throats. And my mother, who would normally be frightened, didn't feel any fear of them at all. She, instead, she begged him not to hurt them. There are parts of this story, which is my mother's story, that I won't include here. They aren't mine to collect and report. It's enough to say that he assaulted my mother, but he stopped short of raping her, likely because he was too drunk, and that she was grateful for that small mercy. It could have been worse. 
In so many ways, she felt lucky. He listened to her pleading and left the dogs in their yard where he found them. They reached a busy street and he made her walk <clears throat> with her arm wrapped around his waist like they were a couple. He tried unsuccessfully to steal another car. They kept walking and ended up on 2222 headed west out of town. It was late by then, not too many cars out on the road. Every time he saw headlights flashing off in the hills in the distance, he would make her lie down in the ditch on the side of the highway until the car had passed. She didn't fight him or try to jump up and wave down a car. She did exactly what he said. He had the knife, of course, and had been telling her stories all night about his aim and strength, war stories from Korea. My mother wasn't athletic and never played sports. Yet that night, she was able to walk for 17 miles, over eight hours, barefoot. Enduring is a kind of pleasing. Hold still, smile. Keep moving, smile. We're taught not to complain, and so we keep walking and keep doing and keep going and keep holding whatever it is we've been given to hold, no matter how heavy. And we never say a word, not if we can help it. I'm a mother now. One night I took my 10-year-old son to a concert, and we decided to leave a few songs before it was over. He was tired, and I didn't think much of it until we pushed through the big glass exit-only signs. Everyone else was still inside listening to the encore. Outside, it was nothing but oceans of empty concrete, my son and I, and a huddle of big men in coats, men in big coats near the bus stop. For a quick minute, I considered trying to get back inside. But I decided it was fine. It wasn't that late, and the show would let out soon. We were only parked a few blocks away. As we walked toward the crosswalk, a man broke free from the huddle and headed in our direction. Hey, he said, big grin, how you doing? The interaction that followed was pedestrian and intimately familiar to all women and female presenting people. The flash of menace in his smile, overly familiar and imposing. My son and I weren't quite to the crosswalk, but he'd stepped into our path. He held his fist out toward me, low for a fist bump. I smiled back and gave him a fist bump. He held his fist out to my son, who looked up at me quickly before following my example. I waited for the walk signal, hoping to get out of there as quickly as we could, hoping he wouldn't follow us. Oh, hey, 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 he said, I don't want to bother you. He leaned toward my son conspiratorially. I just wanted you to know that your mom is amazing, he said, looked me up and down. I kept a smile plastered on my face, tried to nod like thanks, but make no eye contact to encourage no further communication. The light changed and we were able to quickly step past him into the street. I listened for his footsteps, but I didn't hear him. It was different having my kid with me. I didn't turn around. I listened to differentiate our footsteps, what was echo, what might be him. Like all prey, I knew there was a chance he would lose me in the tall grass and let me slip away without notice. It was worth a try. Don't run. I was pretty sure he hadn't followed us, but I didn't look. Not yet. That was weird, my son said. I know, I said. We reached to the other side of the street, and only then did I allow myself a quick glance. No one behind us, but I kept walking fast, on high alert for anyone else who might be lurking about. I began doing my best to explain street harassment to my son and startle him with the news of how young I was when I started and how it still happened to me in certain places, when I was walking alone or at night or really just not with the man. He had felt the weirdness for himself, how not friendly the man's smile had been. Then he asked me something that was harder to explain. But why were you so nice to him, he said. I felt the air leave my body, felt complicit somehow. Because I knew it would be worse if he got angry, I said. Pleasing is slippery because it has to be. Talking to my mother about all this, she says, we're forced to be duplicitous, to be friendlier than we want to be. That's what my son had seen in front of the stadium, his mother wearing a different face. He saw me performing friendliness towards someone who had blocked our path. I didn't like it, but it felt like my only option. Women have been trained to resist our natural impulses. Choose fight and you'll be quickly outmatched. Choose flight and you're prey. Instead, smile and pretend not to be scared. Be someone other than yourself, whatever it takes to please. The two main police detectives who interviewed my mother were both fathers with 19-year-old daughters, and she remembers them being kind to her. But when she tells me the story, I can't stop thinking about the fact that even after the kidnapper let her go, after she made it to a house with a phone and was able to call the police, they never even came to pick her up. They told her on the phone that Michael was dead, asked her to come in to give her statement. But she had to call her friends, and they're the ones who came to get her, and then drove her to the station later. Not that she complained about it, then or 